Hello, Hope. It is good to be back here. I want to start with a number. 20 million. There are at least 20 million people in this world who have the same problem. They don't get to make the most basic decisions about their lives. Someone else chooses when they get up in the morning, where they work, and who touches their bodies. Traffickers are using them as slaves. And I've gotten to see the reality of trafficking up close for the last 15 years. And it's been a journey that has taken me around the globe to some of the darkest corners of our human nature. I've spent a great deal of time with trafficking victims, listening to their stories, and I have spent a great deal of time with traffickers, and I can tell you that they have stories too. For those of you who are somewhat unfamiliar, trafficking is basically compelling someone to work or engage in a commercial sex act, what we call in the United States prostitution. It is illegal in every country in the world and has been criminalized in every state in our union. And yet, the traffickers who engage in this crime employ lots of different business models, and it is big business. The annual profits from trafficking exceed $150 billion a year. And to put that into some perspective, the annual profits from trafficking exceed the annual profits of Microsoft, Exxon, BP, Samsung, and Apple combined. A lot of money. And tonight's topic is the intersection of faith and missions and these great issues. And instead of walking you through the legal framework from the United Nations or from our United States law or what I've seen in India, and we can talk about those, those matters later, I'd really like to just share with you a very personal story that impacts my understanding and my frustration with who God is and who he says I am. Indeed, this idea is the root problem in me understanding God and the necessary foundation for us to move out into missions, the necessary foundation for us to actually go and address the great concerns our world has today. Let me tell you how I first encountered this idea. My wife and I, um, her name is the lovely and talented Linda Marie, and indeed we call her lovely and talented because in college she was both lovely and talented. And we were deciding where were we going to go live? What job were we going to take? And as I often do whenever I'm confronted with a big decision, I find myself returning to James chapter 4. Here's what it says. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. What a discouraging verse. You see, I spent a great deal of my life trying to measure up. I compare myself to others, and I try to figure out, how do I measure up? And I often find that other people seem to have more experience, more resources, more talent, more skills, and I am just not equal to the task. I come up wanting. And when I read James, I am utterly frustrated with God's suggestion that I am nothing more than a mist. Growing up, my mom told me I was special. I have a U11 soccer trophy. 
I'm significant. Everybody wants us to have high self-esteem. And clearly, God in this passage is not attending to our fragile egos. So, I thought I would turn to the rest of Scripture to see if I could find some comfort. Perhaps this was just a rogue verse. And I want to warn you now, I'm going to read a bunch of different passages from the Bible, and don't even try to write them down. Don't put up your emotional Kevlar to sort of fend them off. Just let them wash over you. Psalm 8 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Psalm 39 says, You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom. As he goes to and fro, he bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. So I go from being a mist, to my days are few, to a single breath, to a phantom. Psalm 78, he remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. Psalm 89, remember how fleeting my life is, for what futility have you created men? So finding little encouragement in the Psalms, I turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 40, all men are like grass. And their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely people are grass. Tweet that. (laughs) Isaiah 45 says, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, him who is but a potsherd among potsherds on the ground. I had to look it up. I didn't know what a potsherd was. It's a disposable clay pot (laughs) discarded on the ground. Isaiah 64, we will shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins will, be swept, will sweep us away. Isaiah 64 says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and he says that we are the clay and we are not the potter. Daniel 4 says, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does what he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. So at this point, I'm sensing a theme. But that's the Old Testament. So I turned to the New Testament to see if we could have some new life in the New Covenant. Matthew 10, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And in Matthew 18, the parable of the lost sheep, the incarnate Christ compares us to one of the dumbest animals ever created. John 3 says, I must become less. Galatians 2 says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 2 Corinthians say that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That is, we are merely temporary, disposable jars, potsherds. In James, it says, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. And then Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, powerless, Not Indians, not Americans, not even Michiganders or Virginians, but aliens and strangers, refugees without any rights. And I think there is a reason that God feels the need to continually remind us about our identity. And that's because one of the greatest problems in our culture and in our world and in my faith is thinking that I am important apart from Christ. 
We deceive ourselves into thinking that what we do and what we learn and what we perform somehow matters independently. So let me ask you this. How many of you all know the names of your great-grandparents? Think about it. I tell you what, if you know one name, one full name of your great-grandparents, raise your hand. And the interesting thing is, everyone here actually has at least eight of them. Some quirks of family tradition, you might get more. So how many know at least one? That's pretty good. How many know two? Put them high. How many know four? How many get halfway? Anybody? You got a couple? How many know the names of all eight of your grand, great-grandparents? If you've got fourths and thirds in your family, that can sometimes be helpful. Nobody. Here's what's crazy. They're your family. You don't know who they are. They had jobs and careers and hopes and dreams, and they suffered miscarriages and tragedies and bad winters. They had favorite desserts, and they had joyful holidays, and you are their legacy, and you don't even know who they are, and I bet most days you don't even think about them. And here's the truth. Our great-grandchildren are not going to remember us. You will be an an irrelevant fossil as they go about getting into college, falling in love, starting families, building businesses, and you will never cross their minds. And I think that's okay. Think about this. I was with a a pastor from New York, and he was speaking recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, to a group of very mature Christians, and he asked them this question, who here can name the 12 disciples? Easy question amongst mature Christians. He knew the answer before he ever asked the question. A few of them started to rattle off a couple of names. Almost none of them could name the 12 disciples, which is crazy, right? Like, they're the A-team. People wanted to be part of the 12 and got cut. This is the all-stars. I bet many of you guys do not know the names of the 12 disciples. So I put them up here. Here you go. You got Simon Peter and his younger brother Andrew. You got James and John Zebedee, the sons of thunder, which, by the way, had to be cool. I wish I could have met their dad. Um, (laughs) what, What did he do to get that nickname, right? We will find out in heaven. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, who doubted, Matt, the, who was Levi, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, no one knows about Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, Judas who betrayed Jesus. Now, I bet, honestly, if you were asked, somebody here was thinking Mark, Luke, Paul, Stephen, Silas. Right? And you guys go to Hope, right? This is a Christian college. You don't know them. And I think it's great. So in Matthew 10, it gives us this list, but right after that, he sends out the 72. Now, the 72 were also virtual rock stars, right? They, were, they hung out with Jesus. They knew him personally. They go out on these missions. They actually like heal people. They do miracles. They have this incredible um, legacy. They come back. They tell Jesus about it. Like Their names are not even mentioned. There's not even an attempt in Scripture to tell us who the 72 are. Because they don't matter. All that matters is God and God alone. What he's doing. The great lie, the grand deception that is being perpetrated upon all of us is this suggestion that you are significant. And I happily get to be here tonight to tell you, you're not. (laughs) But if we stopped with this essential truth, about your identity and my identity. We would be accurate, but incomplete. Because we do have significance. Genesis 1 says that we were made in the image of God. Psalm 139 says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Jeremiah says that we were known in the womb before we were even born. And Matthew 10 says that the very hairs on our head are numbered. He numbered the hairs on a phantom's head. That makes the passion even more amazing. 
In Colossians chapter 2, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. So if anyone is seeking fulfillment in their life, there it is. In Christ alone we are fulfilled. That is the good news of the gospel. So, for all those who are suffering under a millennial stereotype, having been told your whole life how exceptional you are and that you can do anything, you precious snowflakes, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that that is half true at best. You need to embrace your insignificance. And for those of you who have been told your whole life that you are worthless, that you have been abused and discarded, that you have been neglected and abandoned and you are alone, I am here to tell you that that is not who you are. That you matter because God likes you. And there is great freedom in knowing who we are and who we're not. I think so many people are depressed and burdened because they're trying to go become something that they were never intended to be. And that is important apart from God. You know, this notion of performance-based Christianity is obliterated by this truth, and legalism is defeated when my identity is correctly seen. Because there is no way I can earn salvation. If at best I am a withered blade of grass, salvation by God's grace becomes the only logical path. So who are we? I'd suggest that we are completely insignificant apart from Christ and eternally valuable because of him. Which really leads to another question, which is then why are we here? And I got asked that question once by my wife on our wedding day, which is not really the question you want to be asked when you're getting married. Why am I here? So the lovely and talented and I met in college my freshman year and got married just a few weeks after I graduated, and I was really excited to get to marry her. Um, I knew that she'd be a beautiful bride and that the reception would be perfect. I knew that it'd be one of the best parties we ever attended and all our family and friends would be there, but I wanted it to be special. I wanted to do something that would give her a great story, a memory. And so I thought about how people leave weddings. Right? Normally you leave a wedding in like a nice car or a carriage, but I felt like that had been done before. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we flew away from the wedding? Like in a hot air balloon. Like that would be the best ever, right? So I contacted, I got out a phone book. You guys don't know what these are, but there used to be giant books <laughs> of phone numbers. And um, I called on that phone with a rotary dial. I heard a busy signal, which is also a noise you've never heard before, but <laughs> brought these hot air balloon pilots out, and they looked at the reception hall, and they, all three of these guys told me the same thing. They said, John, this is not going to work because the balloon is never going to clear the roof, and even if it cleared the roof, it would never get over that stand of trees. So, undaunted, I called a fourth hot air balloon pilot. This guy came out, and he told me exactly what my itching ears wanted to hear. He said, no problem. Okay, so there we are at the wedding. And outside the hall, this giant hot air balloon is being inflated, and nobody has any idea, including the lovely and talented. So as it all finishes up, all the people from our wedding reception corral out and they create this giant channel of people. And the lovely and I run through this channel under a canopy of falling bird seed and she hops into the basket. And it's me in the basket with, with Linda Marie, the lovely, and then hot air balloon pilot number four. So much fun. All of a sudden, he pulls the lever. Shh. 
we start to lift off. And she tosses the bouquet from the basket to the single women waiting on the ground. Kids are waving as we lift off. And then I turned and I saw the slate roof. Now, I've got to tell you, there we are in the basket. Oh, yeah, I wasn't making this story up. This really happened. <laughs> We cleared the roof, and I was feeling really good. It was an amazing ride until I noticed the stand of trees. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, I have a pretty good sense of depth perception and distance, and I registered my concerns with hot air balloon pilot number four and told him to take us higher. And he said, no problem. And just as we got to the trees, the bottom of the basket clips the top of the trees, which sent the basket swinging like a giant pendulum under the balloon, which was great because it drove the lovely and talented into my arms, which was my long-term plan for the evening. But Balloon Boy was killing the mood. So at this point, I had lost all confidence in our balloon pilot, and I said, I think, we should, I think we should land. And he said, okay. And he found a field off in the distance, and we began our descent so that we could walk upon the earth once more. And as we came in for our landing, he began to explain to me that baskets don't have wheels which made sense, but he also did not have a landing crew to sort of catch the basket and steady it as it came down. He said, this might be a bit bumpy. But seeing no other way to get down, we agreed. So we're coming in, and honestly, it felt like we were coming in a bit fast. We come down, and the basket hits the earth and bounces up, hits the earth again, and then all of a sudden the wind whipped the balloon onto its side, causing the basket to be dragged across the cow pasture like a giant pooper scooper. And I kid you not, I'm on all fours, the lovely and talented on my back, and balloon boy underneath me. We just went right across the field. Things had not gone as planned. We slowly came to a stop. Everyone was okay. The hot air balloon pilot hiked to the road to flag down a car that could drive him to a payphone so that he could find someone to help us. I turned the, back at the basket onto its side, and the lovely and talented and I enjoyed a quiet moment in the country. And then she turned to me with this big smile and said, that was an amazing ride. <laughs> and I realized I am the luckiest man in the world. <laughs> and then she said, what are we doing here? Because it's a reasonable question because just a few minutes ago, we were with all of our family and friends at this wonderful celebration of a wedding. And now we're in the middle of nowhere at an FAA crash site. And I think it's a question worth asking because sometimes the momentum of life just drags us into unanticipated places and situations. And we ask, why are we here? And if we're insignificant apart from God, but eternally valuable because of Him, then we wonder, why are we here? And I think the best answer is in Isaiah 43. It says, "...bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth." everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That's our purpose in life. We were created for God's glory, for his pleasure. In Luke 10, Jesus says, yes, Father, for it was your good pleasure. Jesus affirms that it is the purpose of life to please him. In John 5, it says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, 
but him who sent me. Jesus' purpose on earth was to please God. Colossians 1 says, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 2 Corinthians makes it completely clear in chapter 5, So we make it our goal to please him, to glorify him. This is the purpose for which we were created. Our identity and purpose in life is not to follow traditions. It's not to develop innovations or to please our families or even to earn the praise of men. It's not to rescue slaves. It's not to start churches. It's not to care for the poor. Although all those things are wonderful, and they're not mutually exclusive, but our goal, our solitary goal, is to actually bring glory to the God who created us. And guys, this powerful truth was drilled home into my heart when we first landed in India. You see, I was, I was at a law firm doing commercial litigation. We had a great house fun community and a wonderful church, when we felt this nudge, this desire to go with a brand new NGO called International Justice Mission that was just starting an office in India and needed a lawyer. I thought, I could do that. And so we began to set out on this new adventure. Only the lovely and talented was pregnant with our second child and our daughter was just over one when we got on the plane. And everyone told us that it was crazy to move to the developing world, particularly to have a baby there. And I was thinking, having a baby in India, like, they're good at this. They've got a billion people. Like, <laughs> they've got this down. People said, but what does a white southern lawyer from Virginia know about human trafficking and slavery anyway? Well, that was a good point. They told me I had no experience for the job, and I didn't know what I was doing. And they were absolutely right. But you know, I've never quite understood why everyone puts so much emphasis on experience. I mean, the way I see it, the people that built the Titanic had a lot of experience. Right? The people that built the Ark were amateurs. Experience doesn't always have a better track record. And so with no experience, we set out against many of the wishes of our friends and colleagues, and we land in India, and we're just getting used to the sights and the sounds and the smells and the cadence of our new life when my wife went into labor. And so I grabbed our go bag that I had ready and prepared, and we raced to the hospital. Well, actually, we raced to the taxi, and then we sat in traffic. Cows were literally passing us on the side of the road. But we get to the hospital, and then without the benefit of even an Advil, she gives birth to our second child, James. And this grand celebration over creation's first breath, it was absolutely amazing. He was beautiful. And then everything, everything just went wrong. There was blood everywhere. People were knocking things over. They didn't know what to do. She went into shock. She was convulsing on the table. They whisked the baby away. It was a sense of just paralysis took over. No one quite understood. It became clear to me after just a few minutes that um, she had lost a lot of blood and needed a blood transfusion. And they told me, no, she doesn't. It'll be fine. Just wait for the doctors to come. And armed with my sort of Boy Scout first aid merit badge, I was like, no, she really needs blood. This is, this is bad. And the doctors came in, and they realized that the situation was dire. And they said, did you bring any blood with you? And I, I said, no, this is a trauma-certified hospital. You guys told me you had a blood bank. And they said, we have a blood bank, but you don't, you don't want to use the blood there. So I called the two people that I'd gotten to know in India during those first six weeks. And 
I said, I need your help. Linda needs blood. And then I went down to the blood bank, and they took two units out of my arm. And then I walked into the lobby of the hospital, and strangers came up to me, and they shook my hand, and they said their name, and they said, I'm here to give blood for Linda. And this, this unbelievable sense of people, strangers, pouring out blood to meet a need that I was insufficient to meet on my own was not lost on me, even in the moment. And then we went back up to her room. She was unconscious. They started the drip of blood. And four or five doctors gathered around, and they said, she's probably not going to make it through the night. You need to figure out what you're going to do with the baby. And they walked out. And I was sitting in this hospital room all the way across the world from everyone I knew in a country that I hadn't even really gotten to know yet. And it was cold, and it was dark, and it was lonely. And I looked at my wife, and I thought, they're probably right. She may not make it through the night. And so I got the baby to sleep, and then I walked out into the hallway that was empty, and I began to dialogue with God. I began to pray. And the adrenaline of the crisis situation had now given way to just fear and anxiety and worry and anger. And I began to plead with God. And my prayer started like, God, you're going to look bad if she dies. Like, everyone told us not to come. But if she dies, like, people are going to doubt you. I learned really quickly that appeals to God's fragile ego are not as successful as appeals to guys' fragile egos. God was not concerned about how people thought of him. And then I began to to argue to him, God, she deserves to live. I mean, after all, I came over here to do this amazing job. I get to knock down doors and rescue slaves. But Linda, she could be an educator and a mom anywhere. She is such a kind person. If anyone deserves to live, God, it is her. And then I felt God speak in my heart so clearly. And he said, no. No. She doesn't deserve to live. She doesn't deserve anything. I give because I am good. I love her more than you do. I felt like God wanted to get something straight with me from the very beginning of our India journey, and that is you don't earn any spiritual brownie points by moving to the developing world and doing missions. God is not a vending machine in which we insert our token of obedience and then take out our blessing of choice. He wanted me to know that even the slaves that we had come to rescue, they're not entitled to be rescued. God wants them rescued because he created them. He wants them free because they're his kids. I came to God like an advocate, armed with arguments, and the judge of the universe just shot them all down, reminding me that I am insignificant, that I am a vapor, I am a mist. But because of God, we're eternally valuable. Incredibly humbling. I can tell you that Linda made it through the night, and then she made it through the next night, and she was sick for months, couldn't get out of bed. I took care of our our kids. I got to be the primary caregiver which turned out to be a really sweet, sweet season. And she slowly got better. And our daughter continued to twirl, and our son grew, and slaves were being found, and all of a sudden the office was becoming successful, and the story of justice was happening. Wrong things were being made right. But it started with understanding our identity. It started with stopping measuring ourselves. 
You know, if you think about this measuring up trap, this, this sense of we're always comparing ourselves to others, we're always trying to figure out how we're significant, think about the Barbie doll. You know, a really popular doll for a lot of girls, but most women's health education experts, they can't stand it because it suggests really bizarre proportions. This is a photo of a college student that took on the project of saying, what if we made a Barbie doll, a full-size Barbie doll, with the proportions of the doll itself? which is absolutely insane. It stood over six feet tall with an 18-inch waist, and the student was trying to make a point that if you measure yourself with the ruler of Barbie, you have chosen poorly. You know, there are all sorts of rulers out there that we can use to measure ourselves. And as I began to, to think about this, I began to find all these people saying, hey, don't measure yourself by knowledge and strength and beauty and power, but instead measure yourself by the fruits of the Spirit. That kind of made sense for a while, but the deeper I plowed into it, the more that seemed really unsatisfying. And then it occurred to me that those aren't necessarily bad units of measure, it's that when I use them to measure me, I become the object of measure. If you measure God with the ruler of knowledge, you'll find that he's omniscient. If you measure God with the ruler of strength, you will find that he is all-powerful. And if you measure God with the ruler of followers, you will find that he has more followers on, in real life than you guys have collectively on Twitter in this chat snap. Okay, my daughter told me to call it Snapchat. The truth is, guys, that I have realized I've spent most of my life trying to measure up. I'm either working really hard to accomplish something or working really hard to avoid it. One's motivated by pride, the other by fear, but they're both centered on me. And that was God's message. It was stop telling me that Linda's significant. Stop telling me that you're significant. Stop telling me what you deserve and that you measure up. You don't, but I do. I think Moses felt this way. You know, he knew he wasn't qualified to go speak to Pharaoh. He measured himself and decided to avoid God's call. And when God heard Moses' argument that he really wasn't the man for the job, interestingly, God didn't deconstruct his argument with counterpoints. And that's what I would have done. You see, if I had been there, I would have said, Moses, you just need to understand. You grew up in the Pharaoh's courts, you speak the language. You're an inner agency guy. Moses, everything in your life has led you to be the perfect person for this. You can do it, Mo. Like, go get them. You've got the resume. But God didn't do any of that. He just said, you're right, Moses. You don't measure up. But we're not measuring you. We're measuring me. I will go with you. And he did. Because this sense of misunderstanding our identity, of mismeasuring ourselves, sidelines us out of fear. We get, shift into spectator mode where it's like we get this admission ticket into the show, we push through the turnstile and take our assigned seat to see God's wonders. And that's just not how God works. He wants us to join him in seeking justice, to join him in what he's doing. But if you're going to join him in missions, if you're going to join him on the field of play, if you're going to go tackle the grand issues of our day, and there are many, if you're going to be agents of change, if you're going to be ambassadors of grace, then you will have to get this identity piece right, or you will burn out, flame out, and leave a path of broken relationships around you. Moses wasn't just rescued from something, he was rescued into leading his people. I was rescued into God's story of justice and into this story of loving my family. And Linda Marie was rescued into a longer life, and she got to know our son James. And God has rescued you guys into action. So think about it this way, when we measure ourselves, Philistines mock God. When we measure God, kids kill giants. 
When we measure our resources, crowds sit hungry. But when we measure God, we pick up baskets of plenty. And when we measure problems, millions remain in bondage. But when we measure God, people are set free. And we can talk about the nuts and bolts of trafficking and how you stop it. That's why we created the Human Trafficking Institute, which is a natural outgrowth of IJM and my work at DOJ. And they told me I can encourage you to send an email or, or, or hit me up online, and we can talk about your questions specifically about what the world looks like and how you can practically get engaged. But I think a, our identity is the threshold concern. And it is good news that we are insignificant apart from God. And it is good news that we are eternally valuable because of Him. And it is good news that we exist to please Him. And seeking justice pleases Him. So your next steps may not go as planned. You may have some crash landings. But God is with you to the end of the age. Pray with me. God, thank you for speaking clearly to us. Thank you that you love us completely, that there is nothing we can do to make you love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make you love us less, that we are already accepted. God, thank you for the reminder that we are a mist, a vapor, a phantom, and a potsherd. Help us keep that in mind as we press forward to do the work you have called us to do. And now send us out into the world to free your people, to love your people, and to bring flourishing to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.